are back with the deck of the week. Kevin Jones, the daddy, Danny, Dan Ward. Um, and this week we have a deck that's been around since modern conception. It's uh, Affinity. Modern Innies? Modern Inception? Inception. And my clicker's not working. Technical difficulties. Oh no! Starting off this morning. Oh no! The clicker! Now we're going to try it again. And, and take nothing. two? Take two. Take three. Take a chance. Make a change. Inception. Daddy. So this deck, meanwhile, we're figuring out the technical difficulties here. Um, we are live, right? Are we going to rehearse what we're going to say while we're live? That'd be no. We should be good. We're, we're, oh, there we go. To there. We and go. Beyond. All right. Sorry about that, but here we go. So this deck's been around forever. It's had multiple cards banned out of it, and yet still just still around, still kicking butt. One of your teammates this weekend uh, won an open with it. Yeah, Peter Tabersian. What a master he is. He's been playing it a lot. And this uh, this current list is from Shadow underscore PT. Uh, it's a five zero league list. So let's take a peek at yeah, it. Yeah, let's do it. Goodbye, Buzz. All right, so a couple of the unassuming creatures we have here. We've got two Memnites, four Ornithopters, and four Signal Pests. So the free creatures and Signal Pests make the, the backbone of the early game. Okay. And this is usually the way Affinity works, is that it, it tends to, to go wide with these creatures early. Okay. Uh, Vault Scourge is the other creature that formulates this early plan. May or may not be on the next slide. We'll see. And uh, when we use these cards to uh, put pressure on the opponent early so that the opponent has to commit mana resources to beating um, beating these cards, which gives them an opening to resolve their important, really important cards that we'll see on later slides. Um, but yeah, these, these cards are super, super good in a lot of the matchups when you just need to have critical mass and race and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, not much to say about them besides that. Ornithopter, obviously, the evasion makes it better than Memnite. Memnite having a... Having a power is almost irrelevant a lot of the time, as ground creatures don't tend to be super important. Most of the way Affinity wins is uh, with flyers. Yeah, you'll see that the, uh, the z especially the zero mana artifacts are more important just to be able to utilize the more powerful cards, like you said, we're going to get into, uh, because Metalcraft is kind of important in this yeah. deck, and then utilizing other cards like Springleaf Drum. So if you could play that. six Ornithopters, you would. Which you can't, because it's... Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean... But your flying is that idea. important. Yeah, I think so. All right. And then here's some payoffs. So you mentioned Vault Scourge and you mentioned flying's important. This yeah. one happens to have lifelink as well. Yeah, so it's a pretty interesting pattern in that you can pay life to play it early. Okay. And then it gives you back the life, so it's essentially a one mana, one one flyer. Yeah. With lifelink, which is a which is a good thing to have. Yeah, definitely. Um, And then... You see these two uh, inventions, two masterpieces here. <laughs> uh, Steel Overseer and Artbound Ravager. Now, Steel Overseer is one of the fastest clocks in the entire deck. If un unimpeded, it will turn all the small, cheap creatures that we talked about on the previous slides and Vault Scourges, as well as your, your uh, creature lands, into powerful threats in the frame of, you know, just one turn. Yeah, it's interesting it's because Steel Overseer is like a must-kill. Yep. And it, it kind of like goes around the same exact thing as all the two drops in this deck, except like Ravenger you really can't kill because when you go to kill it, it it'll just sack stuff and then modular. And so Steel Overseer and as we're gonna get into cranial plating, these are the two drops that you really need to deal with. When you have um unconditional removal in your deck, I think it's often best to actually kill the Ravager with the conditional removal, leaving them the option to uh, you know, expend a ton of resources to protect it. For example, if they have five artifacts in play, lightning bolt your Arcbound Ravager is a fine play. If they want to sack, you know, three of their five artifacts to keep it alive, sure. it makes your Path to Exile much better later on. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's a lot of ways to, to, to maneuver around Arcbound Ravager, but um, it is one of the most powerful cards in the deck, certainly beca simply because it allows you to have something like Overseer, something like Cranial Plating, which you'll see on a later slide, and say, hey, I have lethal with this, or I have a powerful threat that you must answer with this, and then if a problem arises, it'll just make my Ravager a little bit better, and I can always, like, 
you know, if, if I think you've cast your last removal spell, I can always just pile everything onto the Ravager and jam it down on something else that was unblocked. Yeah. And it leaves you, like, getting quote-unquote comboed. Yeah. I'm really glad the Disciple of the Vault is not legal. Yeah, that was a really hard card to deal with with Wrath, and you get some chip damage in at the you end. Just and just fireball people. All. all right, next one. What do we got up here? All right, we've got a couple more creatures. We've got... So these are the expensive creatures, right? Yeah, the three drops. But with this deck being pretty low to the ground and wanting to just unload its hand, if it's a three drop in this deck, it's got to be pretty powerful. Uh-huh. And so, as we see, these are in tandem with Mox Opal, which is... One of the ways that there facilitates playing them early, that we'll yes. see a Spring Leaf Drum on, on a subsequent slide, which goes very well with the six mana zero or the six zero mana creatures in the deck. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, these f these five creatures make up like some of the super high payoffs. Like Edge Champion is going to be like pretty much unkillable in a lot of game ones. Yeah, it's weird. Like right now, Death Shadow being the number one deck in the format, this card's gone up in a lot of stuff. This card's unbelievable. It is, but there's been times where its champion has not been in the main deck, and you've seen one or two copies in the sideboard. I've seen the split lists. skew as far as 4-1 yeah. in the opposite direction. Right now, I think 3-2 in this direction is good, because yeah. Master is still the best goldfish. Um, and you do play against stuff like Storm, you know, ad nauseum, where like you really just want to kill them as fast as possible, yeah. and like you have sideboard stubborn denials in a lot of cases, so yeah. Master is good in that regard too. But uh, Champion is much better against any of any of the fair decks that you're playing against, as it can't be killed, and with Ravager or Plating, put a Plating on it, it's, it's just it's just unbelievable. And I think that I've lost. I do tend to play fair decks, you know, fair blue X mid range decks. Yeah. So that's probably biased a little bit. But I do think I've lost an overwhelming amount of games to Edge Champion and almost no games to any other part of Affinity. <laughs> like, that, my decks are always really good against Affinity, and if I ever lose, it's only that card. I've lost to gotcha. Ether Grid before, but that's like a little bit weird. And Yeah, that's you know. some sideboard spice. So Mox Opal, it's, you, like you said, it's one of the most important cards in the deck because it allows you to just dump everything out right away. It's a legendary artifact, yet we still see four copies of that. Is that just due to its raw power level? It's just the best, the most, best slash most broken card in the deck. Okay. It's this un unbelievably powerful enabler that should not, probably should not be legal. And the only reason why it is legal is because it forces you to put a whole bunch of artifacts in your deck. And most artifacts are kind of junky. Gotcha. No pun intended. Junk. Ah, ha, 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 I'm great. But, um... <laughs> You know, this deck just plays some of the best ones, and the other artifact decks in modern, like uh, Lantern, you know, play a bunch of weird ones. But Mox Opal is still, like, unbelievably broken in Lantern as well. Yeah. And that's just kind of how how the Mox Opal decks work. But the, its brokenness is mitigated by the fact that you must play a bunch of artifacts. But that said, it's still a very, very powerful card, and enabling, you know, turn two Master or Champion or turn two Plating plus Equip is just really, really messed up a lot of time. Yeah, I've definitely played against uh, Affinity more than my fair share, I think. And um, just the amount of, like, turn twos where their entire hand is on the table. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, man, how can I ever come back from this this card? They wouldn't be able to do it without this card. So They're just like, uh, I'll play a land and pass the turn. And Affinity's just like, <laughs> and just throws their hand at you. Yeah. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the things, too, with Mox Opal, where we see this deck has a lot of uh, creature lands and colorless lands, but this also helps out with the splash, you know, depending on what kind of sideboard stuff Which you're doing. Which is usually Which red is cards good. and blue cards, but yeah. there's also... Thoughtseize from thought time to time. and, like, weird stuff like Rest in Peace sometimes. Yep, true. All right, next slide. All right, so Springleaf Drum, Cranial Plating, and then we have uh, Gal Blast here at the tail end. Uh, Springleaf Drum, always a four of... Yep. Uh, just, one of the cards you hate to draw in multiples as there's really, really strict diminishing returns. Okay. Um, this, this art makes you think about it being a Theros block, which it is, and not nearly as cool as the, o the original Springleaf Drum from Lorwyn, Lorwyn yeah. which um, looks much better in the Affinity deck because you've got like, some sort of, like, artifacts and like, some cool stuff going on. This doesn't look very Affinity-esque because it looks silly. Um, <laughs> but that's just my personal opinion. And nonetheless, the card is very good. It gives you, uh, lets you use your six zero mana creatures in Ornithopter and Knight to get out a turn two three drop or a turn two play plus equip. Again, a great, a great, uh, great play pattern and something that you seek to do with the deck quite often. Um, next on the slide we have Cranial Plating. 
Again. The card I die to more times than I can count. This, this is the card that makes this deck, right? Yeah, I believe so. So, this is the card that um, is responsible for the most broken draws of turn two, attack you for seven. Or, you know, turn two, attack you for seven, turn three, attack you for uh, ten with uh, with insurance if you have removal. and Move my thing over or whatever. Yep. Um... So yeah, cranial plating, it, it goes without saying almost is really, really messed up. And I don't think they really gauged how good this card would be when they made it. I remember this limited format as there was um, a cycle. It was like, I think there was like a handful of them. I don't know if there were five of them, but there were certainly like at least three of them. Yeah, that was I remember there was attached. like a blue yeah, one that like one. gave flying or something, and the green one gave trampled or whatever. Um... But yeah, so I don't think they realized what this card was going to do, or that people were going to put it in a deck literally full of artifacts. Yeah, it's kind of a kind of an unintuitive way to use it because it's just like, oh, plus some one plus zero for each artifact. So you know, we'll play some limited games where this gives plus three plus zero, it's, and it'll be complicated. It's like a nim because yeah. they had like this whole cycle of creatures that got plus one plus zero for each artifact. Yeah, you no, I remember. It's kind of weird, too, because you think of artifacts, you think of blue, like blue-black, Tezzeret, that's still artifacts, yeah. but you wouldn't think of this card, especially the attachability to double black, it just seems kind of, like, off, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, well, the the idea was that it wanted to be like a Nim, and Nim were like this cycle of creatures, you know, a, a whole bunch of creatures that they had in um, in Mirrodin block, and they were, you know, black creatures that got plus one, plus zero for each artifact you control, yep, so they when they made equipment that attached for... Uh, two of each color, the the Nim equipment made sense to make, okay. and it just got real wild and out of control because <laughs> it's just a messed up card when you have things like Mox Opal and Champion in your deck. Yeah. Um, so so up to this point, we haven't seen um, a spell that has a color, and here we are, Galvanic Blast. So the bar is pretty high for spells that cost colored mana in this deck. Sure. And Master of Ethereum is kind of a hedge into that argument because I kind of yeah I kind of forgot about it's that one both because it an looks artifact like an artifact yeah. and a colored spell but it does make all your artifacts way better and is basically an artifact I think the first colored mana is pretty easy when you have hands that have two different colors of mana in them uh, it can be kind of complicated and you have fixers too we have springleaf drum mox opal you know, a lot of decks have moved over yes. to being like one or two glimmer voids and one or two uh, Spire, Spire of Industry, industry yep. so that they don't get blown out to Shatterstorm effects. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just the best you could be doing for one mana. It takes care of the problematic threats while also being able to just go to the face because a lot of times the double Galv Blast draws, like after you've done the attack for seven on turn three, is just kind of huge. Uh, obviously, Metalcraft allows you to do the four damage. And so. we don't see the. Um you know, the Shrapnel Blast and Soul Artifact versions much anymore. But those versions would, like, just get in some early damage and seek to burn you out with bla multiple copies of different blasts and stuff. Blasts. And yeah, you, like I said, we don't really see that list anymore, but Galvanic Blast is, like, the best removal early and a great way to have some reach late. As Affinity can deal 15 to, you know, you know, 13 to 17 damage a lot of the time, struggle with the last three or four points, Blast is really good there. Yeah. It's a good finisher. All right, we have, before we get to the land package, uh, we do have the one of Welding Jar. This, um, I'd say about a year ago now, has been kind of a staple. Ever since Colgan's Command, like, entered into the modern atmosphere, and there's always been one of the top three decks have been playing, like, a copy of this card, mm -hmm. I just think it, it's always been another, uh, another zero mana artifact that they just want to have. Yeah, so this card is, um... Quite obviously, a solid a solid role player, and it being free merits its inclusion pretty pretty simply. Um, Colligan's command do, does help to uh, you know increase the value of this card, as does something like abrupt decay, yep. or in main deck maelstrom pulse, whatever something weird like that. Especially yeah, things like things that can target it. Uh, I think supreme verdict you can regenerate off of supreme verdict too. Yes, you can. So that's another another one that's pretty interesting, or like an anger of the gods type effect that we're seeing main decked in something like sun and moon scred or Val like Cook, uh, Val Val Cook. Cook. exactly that type of thing. So yeah, well, welding jar is a solid one of. Um, I've seen a thought cast here and there in okay. some lists, and I'm kind of surprised that there aren't any in this list. But you know. It all depends on the format 
And th this deck apparently just really wants to get its, get its threats down. Yep. So it has uh, five, five threes, which some decks only have three or four threes. So yeah, it wants to kill them dead. Yep. All right, so we have eight creature lands here. Uh, the Blink Moth and the Ink Moth. Kind of the backbone of this deck, kind of like the role players that don't really get too much of the mention. Yeah, it also brings us to the great debate of is it Nexuses or Nexi? <laughs> the great debate. I like it. I mean, I don't think I've ever said it correctly. I just say the wrong one, and then they're like, oh, no, it's supposed to be this. And I'm like, it's supposed to be this. And they're like, no, it's supposed to be this. Oh, well, well, whatever. <laughs> but um, Blink Moth Nexus and Ink Moth Nexus, um, having eight creature lands in your deck is, is very important. Um, I remember when I played in the World Cup that the, the Ink Moth Nexus were heavily contested between Infect and this deck. So occasionally Brave Souls would put Mutavaults in their affinity deck, which is a little bit interesting. Yeah, it takes away, I think. Um, I think that, that this card is certainly great as it gives you a way to be infinite life. Yeah, it's flexibility. And, you know, uh, something like Ad Nauseam, it's also really good against too. But yeah, the flexibility of being able to go for the poison plan when they have life gain spells or something like that, it, it's really important. And um, Blink Moth's ability to pump Ink Moth is also super important as uh, when you're pumping an Ink Moth, you're effectively getting it plus two plus two. Yeah, and just sometimes activation. just activating as a creature, getting the master up one, yeah. being able to block and sack with Ravager and play. All these things just allow the deck to operate on a with, different level. With, with, um, with Thoughtcast, you often see, like, tap my Blink Moth Nexus to activate it or whatever so that I have more for affinity for Thoughtcast or, like, uh, tap, activate my Nexus Galvanic Blast or whatever. Stuff like that yeah. happens all the time. When you're, you know, when you're low on resources, so uh, these cards are pretty versatile for lands that have for colorless mana, and they're pretty interesting as they really add to the complexity of the deck. And I think that um, as was for what's essentially just an aggro deck, which is what Affinity is, it's just yeah, an aggro deck. Best aggro deck. Uh, yeah, probably one of the best aggro decks of all time, actually. Um, but for what's just an aggro deck, having eight creature lands and like so much versatility and so much inherent flexibility in their creature land base. Is really really powerful and really will put the deck over the top. So next it up, Daddy. Next this up, I like it. Next it up. All right, yeah, four Dark Steel Citadel. Um, you cannot insole it. In Ancient Grudge it. You can insole it. People aren't doing that. Not right in now. this deck though. But you certainly can. If someone did it in Vegas against me, it was great. Lives through Shatterstorm. It does. Lives, lives through all the hate. It's pretty nice. It's also like one of the best cards to have in play in tandem with Edge Champion. And Glimmer Void. Yeah, and Glimmer Void too, but especially Edge Champion because... It counts too. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will like see the Edge Champion and if they're playing like a fair control deck or a fair rule deck, they'll just be like, oh man, so I gotta like kill this thing and this thing and then untap, kill this thing and then I can kill the Edge Champion in response to them activating their land or whatever. And um, Dark Souls Citadel is just like, oh, well you can't try to cheese me, you can't like kill my Dark Souls Citadel, so you probably <laughs> can't kill my Edge Champion, you know? Yeah. Um, so just a really good land, counts as obviously a land, and counts as an artifact for Metalcraft, and as you were saying, has really good uh, synergy with Edge Champion. We talked about the split here. Is this just due mainly to the you know, amount of Graveyard Hate, Shatterstorm, Vandal Blast, um, Fracturing Gust type of stuff, they don't want to get blown out as much? The double Spire draws are way better than double Glimmer Void draws. Okay. Um, so I think that just because you can switch and deviate a little bit, I think you should. Okay. As the one life, again, Affinity is often the aggressor, also has like a lot of ways to gain life. And by a lot of ways, I mean Vault Scourge. <laughs> Which is enough ways to gain life. Yeah, and because one point here life and there. is rarely under attack, more so than theirs is. Correct. Okay. Um, yep. And we got one basic mountain, <laughs> one copy of Patrick Sullivan. Yeah, I was just going to say Patrick Sullivan um, love it. Just there, you know, they have uh, got a red spell in the deck. Yeah, you've got the the spell you're gonna cast with one land is Galvanic Blast. Yeah. You know, if, if you if you had a second basic, it would be an island for uh for Master of Ethereum and you know any of the sideboard Maybe cards. Maybe cast in some of the lists, but, but this um, is also you know some kind of protection against Path of Exile. Yes, it's, it's some protection against Path as well as like um facilitating the sideboard cards that are good against Path decks. Gotcha. And Gear Up or Aether Grid is a card that is good against Path decks, and this helps you cast it earlier because they Path your creature give you the mountain and it makes it easier. 
All so right. that's just kind of a, a little plan there. Let's see if we got that in the side, but let's get right to I it. I hope you do, because I'm going to sound really dumb if you don't. <laughs> that was a rest in peace. I was right about that. I've All seen right. that recently. So we have, here we have a bunch of one-ofs, and this is typical for an Affinity sideboard to have a lot of one-ofs and two-ofs. They want to be as diverse as possible and flexible. That's just good in sideboards in general, I think, but because you have the option to just play lots of different colors. Well, this is essentially three cards against a dedicated graveyard. graveyard eight. Eight. But you're allowed to, to board in, like, Cage against Company decks. Like, you could even board in Relic against, if there's a lot of Witnesses and things in the Relic, you know, replaces itself and is an artifact that adds to a lot of the synergies. Yep. So it's fine there, but then when you play against a dedicated graveyard deck like Dredge, you, you board all three of them in and they're all great. Yes. Um, so that's the idea. You're just kind of hedging a little bit and adding the additional, like, marginal implications of having artifacts because uh, artifacts don't really hurt you so much. Gotcha. So you would do this here where in a fair deck you might be like, oh, I'm going to use other cards to combat, you know, counters company and stuff and then I'm just gonna have a bunch of resting pieces so I don't lose to uh dredge or whatever. Uh, a couple of bullet cards that just you know do what you want them to do but also you know with relic and graphics cage can be conducive to your normal game plan. Yep. Alright. Then we got some colored some stuff. More one -ups. I like one ups. Dispatch, uh, Whip Flare and Ancient Grudge. So Dispatch I think uh, we used to see this card when Splinter Twin was a deck. And since Splinter Twin has, you know, been taken out to pasture, I think that we saw a, a major, like, down, downswing in the number of people that played this card. Sure. And I think the advent of Death Shadow, the ascension of Death Shadow to, like, the pinnacle of the modern metagame, has resulted in seeing some, sm some slight inclusions of this card again. And I think that is generally correct. Insect be gone. Um, <laughs> an insect landed on my leg. That's why we do these things live, you know, you can't make this up. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I think that Dispatch is quite good against Death Shadow, obviously. Yep. That's why I like it. And um, uh, I think that it's a good card to be playing in, a, in, as a, uh, in small numbers. Going forward, we got a Whip Flare. Yeah, I like Whip Flare. We've seen the Abzan Company decks um, kind of come to fruition now. That they're mm -hmm. actually starting to get, to get the numbers right. And I think the deck is uh, it's just one of those going to be a top tier deck for a while. Anytime you put like good value creatures together with cards like uh, Co Collected Company, and just like every set comes out with new creatures, so whenever you have a toolbox type of deck, we've just seen the la latest iteration um, going away from you know they still play the Vizier here combo, yeah. but now we have the Vizier combo. We also have like Hate Bears decks, yeah, and like the occasional like deck with Young Pyromancer in it. Okay, um, that makes sense. Things like that, Whip, Whip Flare is still a, so, a solid inclusion. Um, could get really crazy and hit something like Ice the Same Trapped, I guess. Yeah. Or if you were worried about like timely reinforcements, this card is a kind of a decent foil to that. Yeah. But most of the time, it's just going to be Counters Company decks, Hate Bears decks, um, maybe zoo. maybe Burn or Zoo, okay. um, the Burning Tree Zoo deck for sure. But yeah. we don't see a lot of that deck anymore either. And the next card here is another red two drop, an ancient grudge. Mirror match. Great for the mirror, as you can often produce the red mana pretty reliably, and one green on subsequent turns is not that hard. Yep. Um, you're all, often al almost never going to like mill this or discard it or anything <laughs> like that, so those things are pretty really relevant. Um, if you cast it from the graveyard, you probably also cast it from your hand, which means that you got a two for one, which is great. Yeah, especially in the mirror, you know, having an artifact removal, I think that's just. You know, having having that in your sideboard, having a piece of removal is always good. But because of how backbreaking and mana efficient it is in the mirror match, like I've seen up to two, like three is a little, little excessive, I think. But I've seen I've seen one to two copies of this card in uh, a lot of affinity sideboards, and I think it's well warranted. It's certainly a great um, a great sideboard card, and then we can see some other additional artifact hate that doubles as enchantment hate in uh, wear tear. So this card will be able to kill a gr uh, you know a plating or a master in the mirror while also being able to kill a stony silence against a white deck. Sure. Or... Worship. Daybreak corner. Worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of daybreak corner. Nobody plays that card. But I know what you're saying. Um, and then we've got a card that's unbelievably hard to read. Shame on our production manager for putting it there as that. But that's two copies of an invocation spell pierce. Um, they play Matt from the open. It still counters a spell unless you pay two, a non-creature spell unless it's caster base. Correct. Or, yeah, unless it's caster base two. 
Uh, even if you can't read what it does, just believe your opponent when they tell you that that's what it does. Yeah, we've um, seen this, sometimes you mentioned before, it could be the place of Stubborn Denial. In this case, it's Spell Pierce. It's a little bit more flexible than Stubborn Denial in that you don't have to, like, assemble a Voltron beforehand. Correct. And um, with Fatal Push being in the format, Fatal Push being cast on turn two, this is still live, whereas Stubborn Denial does not stop, you know, Fatal Push when they have two mana. Or yep. Something like Fatal Push, and then, oh, I can't counter it, so then they're going to cast a Thought Seize or something else or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I like Pierce there. Also, the, like, crucial amounts of mana that the Death Shadow deck plays is usually stops around three. It will, like, as it floods out in the later game, it will start to have more lands in play, but the, the amount of lands it has in play when really important spells are being cast is usually between two and three. Yeah. So because of that, I think that Spell Pierce is a, is a great point to focus on. Yeah, it, it really, it allows you to set up your game plan and then kind of play, you know, protect the queen, so to speak. Also, like, they're not really sorcery speed fatal pushing. Usually they're, like, cantripping it and, um, you know, doing doing instant speed things, thought scours, serum visions, discard spells or whatever, and then just maximizing mana efficiency so you can just tag them with this a lot. Yeah. Um, just the way that the games play out. And the two thought seizes here, um, a lot of the post-board affinity games slow down. It's a good card for that, as it can beat their slow interaction against your plan, and then you can just kind of grind them out with one ones and you know inevitability um, in your man lands and stuff like that. With being one of the most popular decks, too, it really like the, these two cards, Spell Pierce and Thoughtseize. Uh, I played the deck, like I said, uh, against the deck a lot, and these cards are just mainly to flush out the hate cards because it's one of those decks that when you prepare, unless it's that good of a matchup. Like maybe Grixis Control, for example. Um, you just there's going to be Haymaker cards, Stony Silence, yeah. uh, Ancient Grudge, all these cards. Ancient Grudge not as much because it's like a, a one and a half for one. Or yeah, but even like, the non Shadow Grixis decks, you know, yeah. Delver and Control have another K Command, a Static Caster, and an Explosives or yeah. whatever. Which is still backbreaking. Like those are still yeah. huge. And you need difficult. You just cards. need a card to be able to take that card out and clear the path. Some of them have a Coslex return, which is really, really good against your edge champions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It destroys them. Um, before we move to the next slide, I just wanted to bring up with Wear and Tear too. This is also maybe the split, as opposed to having the second Ancient Grudge. I really like Wear and Tear because not only does it just destroy an artifact when you need to get rid of one, but in the mirror matches, we're going to get into the next slide. One of the most important cards to deal with in the mirror is actually an enchantment, and it's Gaither Aether Grid. Yep, Gyrapur Aether Grid is very good against the Mirror. Any other small creature deck like Counters Company would be pretty good against too. It's also one of the most powerful uh, representations of inevitability against a deck like Jeskai Control, Grixis Control, yeah. Grixis Delver, Grixis Shadow even. The card's pretty cool and it does a great job of offsetting when people bring in Stony Silence because you can still yep. use the Aether Grid to get in some damage. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but like like you mentioned, any of the decks that have a, like a lot of small creatures, yeah. being able to just put a bunch of these cheap artifacts mm -hmm. in play and just machine gun them out like Goblin Sharp Yeah, Shooter. it makes it also so that your your top decks, when you have, when they have Stony, are not completely dead. Yeah. You're still getting a little bit of incremental advantage from your own cards, which is nice. Okay. Um, Las Vegas, I watched poor Cedric Phillips playing fairies, get this card resolved against him. That's and it went weird. about exactly as how you would expect. <laughs> it was pretty pretty sad. Yeah. But um Fairies is cool. Wish it was great. It's probably not great. Uh Ether Grid is great, though. Out of the sideboard for this deck. And this brings us to two more three mana sideboard cards. One being the uh fourth edge champion, uh which is important in a variety of matchups, mainly Jess Guy Grixis, something like Abzan. Fair decks like that that um, that don't have a ton of sweepers, um, but do have a ton of spot or targeted spot removal is where Edge Champion really shines. Again, gives you the quickest clock. Again, this card is really hard to beat for these decks. So like, even when the games slow down, like they're taking out some counter spells because they don't think they're going to slow down that much or don't know exactly how much you're going to slow down, and as a result, like don't want to get caught with counter spells in hand uh, when they're way behind on the board. So like. Even though the counter spells are likely to be much better against champion in post board games, people are still incentivized to bring them out and not necessarily wrong for doing so. Okay. Which is a complicated little bit of uh, back and forth, but uh, it makes sense. So yeah, so uh, champion is good in a lot of different ways there, and it's even good when the game slows down, as it represents inevitability. And both of you are like you know pulling punches here and there, and uh, it's a, it's, so it's a great card in grindy games as well as fast games. Sure. And then a blood moon. 
We just have Why the one of Blood right? Moon. Why not? It's kind of free. Yeah. You know, with running one, you're never going to run free. into the drawing the second one. But it is kind of awkward shutting off the, the lands. Yeah, so you're shutting off your creature lands in, in spots where Bless. they're uh, less good. Okay. Uh, for example, Blood Moon great against the Red Green Valakut deck. As they can do a very good job of staying alive a couple turns until they kill you. But if you have this, if you have Blood Moon, you're going to obviously kill them before they can deal with your first wave, deal with your second wave, deal with your Blood Moon, and then kill you. Gotcha. Like that type of thing is kind of tough. So the Blood Moon's good there, but some of the you got to be wary about using it against something like Jeskai. It's probably good against that deck. It's probably good against Grixis too. But like uh, the fair decks are where your creature lands really shine, as they're often going to get a couple two for ones on you, and you need to mitigate that by having them trade spells for your lands at some point in the game. Yep. Um, so Blood Moon won't permit you to be able to do that. And if they can cast their spells and you can't attack with your creature lands, you're in a tough spot. Yeah, Blood Moon, I think, really thrives in the matchups you talked about when you're on the play because of the fast mana mm -hmm. and makes your opponent like, all right, well, they either have to keep up Spell Pierce if they have that in their deck or they're going to be tapping out for a Serum Visions or a Celestial Colonnade. And then on turn two, you're just slamming a Blood Moon, and the game's literally over. Oh yeah, that, that's great. That, that 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 pattern is great for yeah. sure. Yeah, so I agree 100. percent All right, I would seek to do that whenever possible. Final thoughts. What my final thought is? What? Uh, hit me in the snooze button. Ah. Yeah, hitting the snooze. button. I don't know if you knew that I was. Woohoo! I almost fell off my chair. I don't know if you knew I was sleepy today, but I am sleepy. Fourth of July was yesterday. I was out and about. You know? Yeah, me too. Living me life. Too. It's a good time. So as far as Affinity goes, you think they're, the next card that's going to be banned would be? Is going to be banned? No, if you had to ban a card. From Affinity or yeah. just had to ban a card, period? Well, from Affinity, since we're doing the deck of the week on Affinity. All right, man. Easy on me. <laughs> uh, Mox Opal. Why? Because it's Fast Mana. Fast Mana's broke. You think that if Mox Opal leaves the deck, this deck will still be a Tier 1 deck? Do we want it to still be a Tier 1 deck? I guess we always want it to be a Tier 1 deck, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it could survive without Mox Opal. I think it would be a much worse. Uh, notably, much worse against like combo decks and stuff like that. Stuff like Valakut, stuff like Ad Nauseam, Storm. Just it slows down even Goldfish. More. But the card is still like fundamentally messed up. Um, I don't really think that anyone complains about the power level of Edge Champion besides me. And I don't think anyone really complains about Ravager, Master of Ethereum, or, or Plating even that much. Like if you ban Plating, the deck is dead. I think if you ban Blood Moon, or not Blood Moon, sorry, um, Mox Opal, the, the deck can survive in a, you know, reduced power level form. That's still fine. If you ban Blood Moon... Yeah, cool. if you ban Blood Moon, then... I don't know, they could ban Blood Moon. I, I hate that, Blood I, Moon. I think the format would survive. Blood Moon's a stupid card. All right, well, that's going to do it for this week's Deck of the Week. I'm Dan Ward. And I'm Daddy. And we'll see you next week with a new Deck of the, deck of the Week. week. Daddy is ready. The refs are ready. Are you ready? Yes. Left exemplar on turn two. Attack you for seven. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> we'll see Have you next week, one, guys. Thank 12 you. 30. We'll be back and better than ever. <laughs> oh, I'm doing a dab. <laughs>